here's a hypothetical situation for you. I've got only one slot available in my week and I get two phone calls from families needing treatment on the same day. The first is from a family of a 15 year old child who has two parents and they call to tell me that he has OCD and they want family therapy to help support him. The second call comes from the family of a 15 year old who refuses to go to school whenever mum and dad start fighting. Which would you choose? Call A or call B? Both? Confused? I'm a family systems therapist and here's how I would decide from a family systems perspective. Option A is a very typical call you might get in your private practice. Some concerned parents looking to support their child around a symptom. And it's probably something that I could figure out and help with. And I'd be totally okay doing this, to be honest. But I don't know anything about the system. All I've got is an IP, some OCD and parents. Assuming that there are no surprises, option B gives me so much more to go with. The system is pretty much spelled out. I've just got so much more information on relationship dynamics. Mom and dad fight and their child acts out. And I'll posit a guess that when he acts out, mom and dad's fighting decreases. It's a loop that I can already imagine. I can imagine the circularity around it. I can kind of see what I'm doing already. When I know the pattern in a family that supports a symptom, I have a much clearer plan for treatment. I can work on interventions that interrupt this cycle at any point. Compared to A, this is much juicier, at least systemically. Now, what if I were to tell you that they were the same family and I used circular questioning in my first session to transform the information from option A to the information to call B? So it's a true story. The family came in saying that they wanted to support their child with OCD, but the technique of circular questioning allowed me to understand what was really going on in the family. And that was that there were some serious issues between mom and dad that were impacting their child who was acting out as a result. Circular questioning is the technique I'm going to explain in this video, and it is a game changer. It helps you understand all of the moving parts in a family system so you can start to formulate what patterns are in place that supports the system and the current dysfunction. I use circular questioning in the first few sessions to try to create a sequential description of events around how members of the family behave and feel before and after an episode of the problem behavior. Just like this. I also refer to this as a sort of pattern of interaction. It's a little less of a mouthful. But this implies that we firstly need to identify the problem around which we're investigating interactions. Strategic family systems only target one problem at a time. And if you're successful and you deal with that problem, then you're welcome to move on to the next problem or you can terminate. Circular questioning gets the family members to describe, allude to and elicit descriptions of interactions around uh, events that trigger the problem behavior. It helps us understand how the identified patient is treated while the problem behavior is um, exhibited. It helps us learn how members of the network try to deal with the problem, um, the outcome of any solutions that they've tried in the past, so we know what doesn't work. Once this cycle of interaction has been identified, usually in the first few sessions, the rest of the time in treatment can be spent on developing and finding ways to interrupt the pattern so the behaviors stop. Problem identification. Now, you might be tempted to skip this section because it might feel like I'm belaboring a point, but identifying the problem is so important. Getting very specific on this issue is going to set you up for the rest of treatment. It's going to be an anchor that you hold on to 10 sessions from the first one where you're a bit lost and confused. So let's say I had a new family in my office and I were to ask, what is the problem? Uh, and I got an answer of my son is acting out. Well, if I were to accept that answer and not dig around using circular questioning, well, maybe I would figure things out, maybe I wouldn't. But when you work or think systemically, you assume that all symptoms are relationally driven. So when I assume that, I just can't accept my son's acting out at face value. I will need to ask more questions. If all symptoms are relationally driven, here's some of the questions that I might ask to get a little bit further. If there were creepy big brother cameras in the house, what would I see that would let me know that acting out is occurring? Under what circumstances does he act out? What happens after? When does it happen? When does it not happen? Who is around when it happens? Who is not around when it happens? You get the picture, right? 
If you, if you start asking everyone in the room questions like this, you will get so much more information than my son acts out. In fact, it might sound more like, I get worried about my son and his school performance, so I tend to ask him a lot of questions and bug him about his homework. This makes him irritable and we often get into conflict, which can escalate to the point where I feel scared or powerless, at which point I call my husband. Now, up until that point, my husband has stayed out of the conflict, but when he gets that call, he comes in guns blazing and he takes over. My son feels ganged up on and resentful and withdraws from our relationship, then acts more secretive and shows me less of his grades and doesn't come to me with problems, so his grades dropped. I could start the and session like that, saying, so what is the problem? It's a cycle. That's a little bit more helpful than my son acts out. So what do you ask? Well, I could start the session like that, saying, so what is the problem you'd like my help with? The issue with that is one parent's probably got a semi-scripted answer for this question and is anticipating you asking it. It will be IP focused and probably have a lot of historical data. So when he was seven, he fell out of a tree and had this concussion. And although we've had brain scans, I think that this is... Another option is that the family will not have a clue how to answer that question. And they will take turns giving different opinions on how or why the IP is the problem. Also not very helpful. Or they will play nice and say communication issues or look blankly because the family doesn't actually have a problem, it's the IP. So let's refine that question a little more. How about something like, I'd like each of your opinions on what you think the problem going on right now is. This line of questioning gets family members thinking systemically right from the start. They are being told that they are expected to and have something valuable to contribute. And that the spokesperson for the family, which is usually the person that called, is treated like an equal and isn't the be all and end all of knowledge of the family. On that note, I would follow up and deepen with each individual when they give you an answer. So things like, do you agree with what mom said or would you change anything? Is dad usually right with things like this? It's going to be really helpful and get you more information and build up that sort of rapport. So how about we change the question to what is the problem in the family right now that you would like my help with? Some version of this sort of falls out of my mouth. Um, I like it because the right now part indicates that I don't want to hear about that story about the time he was seven and fell out of the tree yet. I don't really want to start with the in-depth historical intake. Now, you probably do need one, but not in the first session. I want to know what the problem is. By talking about the problem head on in the first session, I'm not colluding with any family secrets or rules that we don't talk about the fact that our kid hits us or we don't talk about the fact that dad drinks too much. I had one family who came in um, dealing with sort of this very horrific situation with their teenager and uh, I could tell that they didn't want to talk about it. So I kept on asking about the details of this event that had happened to them and I could see that they were getting uncomfortable, but I knew I had to do it because if I didn't talk about it, I'd be joining the family's rules and secrets of not talking about this event. So I'm also saying, what is the problem you'd like my help with? And that means that I'm setting the tone around this being therapeutic. We're here as a family to work on the problem. It insinuates that I can't really help your son get better grades, but I can definitely help your family understand what's going on in the relationships that doesn't allow him to study. Now, if all else fails, try asking something like, what changes do you want to see in your family? Or if I could make any changes in your family, realistic or magical, what would it be? If the family is sort of giving you the runaround on telling you directly what the problem is, then this line of questioning is less threatening and sometimes helps get them to be more forthcoming. And you can circle back then to identify the problem once they're talking about the changes they want to see. So I would like to change our communication. I'd jump in and say, well, what tends to happen with the way communication is happening right now? Or if you can't, if I can't change the way you communicate, what will happen to the family in a year from now, in five years from now? Whatever the answer you get, I think it's important to remember that all behavior is communication and more information can be gained from understanding behavior. Circular questioning really helps with this. Often we just infer another person's internal state with a comment like she's depressed. Family systems would get some elaboration on that. Like what does she show when depression is present? Oh, she slams doors and isolates and won't eat. Well, that's a very different version of what depression looks like compared to what I think it looks like. So asking about specific descriptions around behaviors is really helpful. 
when you do get answers about the problem, don't stop there. Go deeper by asking what you would see or what you would notice. I would try and encourage you to get a consensus or an agreement on what the problem is. Uh, that's so that the family feels confident about what they're doing in future sessions and you don't get sideswiped with a change of mind later on in treatment. So who do you ask? Well, you've got some options here. The IP. I usually don't start with the IP because that would reinforce their position as being the problem. Stay away from that. The spokesperson. Well, this is probably the person that called you. Often in a family session, you've got one person who wants to start the conversation or do more of the talking. And I don't think you can assume you know who they are just because they're doing the talking. Um, they Often they'll have a script that they recite to you. Um, often they think that they know what is going on. So I'd avoid them. I'd try and go for somebody who isn't the IP and isn't the spokesperson. The youngest in the room. Well, the person at the lowest end of the hierarchy, often the younger sibling, has a very different and sometimes more honest view of what is going on. This could be a good place to start, but if there's too young, I probably wouldn't go there, wait for them to feel more comfortable. And then my final thought is thinking about the hierarchy. If parent A has done all of the talking with you, parent A was the one that called you, I'd perhaps start with parent B. The most powerful person in the family is the most important to identify as we want their buy-in for treatment. Just because dad is being quiet doesn't mean that he's distant. Engage him as much as possible um, and even perhaps even more than other people. So often there's one parent that's more involved and one parent that's less involved. And I think a solid option is always to go for the less involved parent first. Bring them out, insist that they're gonna be involved in treatment. Circular questioning is really more powerful when you use it to explore a speculation or idea you have of what's going on in the family. Linking your questions to the hypothesis creates a purposeful and coherent interviewing pattern where information is revealed to the therapist and the family at the same time. You should be able to get a sense of the problem from the intake call. Um, so arm yourself with the right questions as soon as you have to call that parent back. And these are kind of similar to what we've talked about already. What is the problem you need my help with? You're going to ask that same question again when everyone's in the room, but you can always ask it on the phone just to get uh, you know, one person's take on what it is. On that note, you want to insist that everyone in the household comes to the family session. Don't let it be just the IP and a parent. Let it be both parents, the siblings. You want everyone in the, in the house and actually everyone in the system in the family session. So that might be grandma has to come in if grandma spends a lot of time at home.